Thank you for that introduction, and welcome to the program Prescribing NSAIDs, a new trend to abide by ongoing FDA recommendations. In this program, we will identify the FDA warnings and recommendations regarding the prescribing and use of NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We will review the risk factors associated with an increase in cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, and renal adverse events in patients using NSAIDs. And we will describe treatment strategies and counseling points to comply with recommendations to use the lowest effective dose in attempts to minimize the risk of adverse events. NSAIDs are widely prescribed by practitioners and frequently chosen by patients over the counter for the treatment of mild to moderate pain. A 2013 article in the Journal of Pain reported that NSAIDs were the most commonly prescribed and most preferred drugs to treat chronic pain. In 2012, it is estimated that 98 million prescriptions were filled for NSAIDs, and an estimated 23 million Americans use NSAIDs over the counter, with ibuprofen being the most popular NSAID in the United States. On this slide, I have data from two national drug usage surveys, the IMS National Prescription Audit 2013-2014, and the Pharmacy Times Report from 2012. In the IMS National Prescription Audit, the brand name NSAIDs Celebrex and Voltaren Gel rank number 13 and number 31 respectively based on prescription volume from March of 2013 to March of 2014. According to the 2012 Pharmacy Times report, also based on prescription volume, several brand and generic NSAIDs rank in the top 200 drugs. As you can see from this list, there are two ibuprofen products, two naproxen products, meloxicam, and Celebrex in the top 200. Despite their popularity and widespread use, NSAIDs carry an increased risk for gastrointestinal and renal complications and a small but very real increased risk for serious cardiovascular events as well. Evidence shows that these risks are increased in individuals with risk factors for cardiovascular and gastrointestinal complications and may be influenced by factors such as higher dose and longer duration of therapy. Because of these risks, the FDA, along with medical organizations such as the American Heart Association, the American Gastroenterological Association, and the American College of Rheumatology, all recommend using the lowest effective dose of NSAID for the shortest duration possible to minimize the risk of adverse events. Let's begin our discussion of NSAIDs at the beginning and take a look at how these drugs are used in practice today. Prescription NSAIDs are indicated for the treatment of pain due to several types of arthritis. These include rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, juvenile arthritis, and ankylosing spondylitis. They are also indicated for pain that occurs from general inflammation, such as tendonitis, bursitis, and acute gout. Prescription NSAIDs are indicated in the treatment of primary dysmenorrhea and for the treatment of other general mild to moderate pain from conditions such as lower back pain, neck pain, injuries, and trauma. While many times these types of conditions are acute and only require short-term therapy, we know there are also times when these conditions are chronic and will require long-term therapy for pain relief. A few NSAIDs are also available over the counter. These products are indicated to treat minor aches and pains due to headache, backache or toothache, muscle aches, menstrual cramps, pain from the common cold, the flu or a sore throat, and minor arthritis pain. Over-the-counter NSAIDs are also indicated for the temporary reduction of fever. NSAIDs decrease pain and inflammation by inhibiting the cyclooxygenase enzyme. So let's take just a minute to remember that there are two isoforms of the cyclooxygenase enzyme, referred to as COX-1 and COX-2. Cyclooxygenase 1 is often called the constitutive form of the enzyme because it's found in many tissues throughout the body where it's responsible for the production of protective thromboxanes and prostaglandins. Cyclooxygenase 2 is the inducible form of the enzyme and is associated with the production of prostaglandins that cause inflammation. When NSAIDs inhibit COX-2 in the joints, this decreases inflammation and reduces pain from arthritis and gives the desired effect of NSAIDs. However, inhibition of NSAIDs in other tissues can lead to side effects. 
When NSAIDs inhibit COX-1 in platelets and the endothelium, platelet aggregation is prohibited and can cause bleeding. Inhibition of COX-1 in the gastric mucosa causes increased secretion of gastric acid and decreased secretion of protective gastric mucus, which can cause GI events such as ulcers. While more complex, the inhibition of COX-1 and COX-2 can cause an imbalance between thromboxane and prostacycline that leads to increased blood clotting and increased cardiovascular events. This slide shows a list of NSAID products available by prescription, identified by both brand and generic name. Celebrex is the only NSAID on this list that is cyclooxygenase 2 selective and does not bind to the cyclooxygenase 1 isoenzyme. These COX-2 inhibitors were designed to decrease pain and inflammation in the joints without affecting the gastroprotective properties of cyclooxygenase 1 in the gastric mucosa. All of the other NSAIDs, generally referred to as traditional NSAIDs, block both cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2 to varying degrees. As you can see, this is a pretty long list of products available to prescribers. You will also recall from the previous slides about numbers of prescriptions written, and you'll notice from your own practice experience that some of these are more widely used than others. In addition to products available only by prescription, there are also NSAIDs available over the counter. Although there are only two NSAIDs approved for OTC use, there are many versions of these NSAIDs available to choose from. Ibuprofen is marketed as both Motrin and Advil. For pain, there are Motrin IB caplets and tablets. For pain and sleep, there are Motrin PM caplets. And for pediatric patients, there's Motrin suspension and an infant drop. In the Advil line, there are Advil tablets, fast-acting film-coated tablets, and liquid gels just for pain, plus an Advil migraine. For pain and sleep, there are Advil PM caplets and liquid gels. For respiratory relief, there is Advil congestion relief, Advil allergy and congestion relief, Advil cold and sinus, Advil allergy and sinus. And finally, there are also pediatric formulations that include Advil infant drops, children's Advil suspension, junior strength Advil chewables, and junior strength Advil tablets. Naproxen is marketed for pain as Aleve caplets, tablets, liquid gels, and gel caps, as well as Aleve easy open arthritis cap and soft grip arthritis cap to make opening bottles easier. For respiratory relief, there is Advil D sinus and cold and Advil D sinus and headache. In addition to all of these branded products, there are also various generic versions available as well. So as you can see, the number of products available for patients to choose over the counter is also quite large. As we already mentioned, traditional NSAIDs bind both the COX-1 and COX-2 isoforms to varying degrees. This slide gives us some perspective as to which NSAIDs are selective for COX-1 and which are selective for COX-2. Solendec and ibuprofen um, highlighted in the box are nearly neutral in their affinity for COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes. As we move down the list on the right-hand side, away from Selendac and ibuprofen, the selectivity for the COX-2 enzyme increases. As we move up the list on the left-hand side of the slide, the selectivity for the COX-1 enzyme increases. I know some of you are asking yourselves, what about aspirin? And that's a good question. Aspirin does inhibit the cyclooxygenase enzyme, so technically it is an NSAID. But for the purposes of this program, I'm not going to discuss aspirin with the other NSAIDs for two reasons. The first reason is that aspirin is not as widely prescribed for the treatment of pain and inflammation as the traditional and COX-2 selective NSAIDs. And secondly, aspirin does not carry the same cardiovascular warning that the other NSAIDs have. Aspirin does increase the risk of gastrointestinal bleeding, and aspirin can be relevant in patients taking other NSAIDs. So I will mention aspirin within those contexts whenever it's appropriate in this program, but I will not discuss it generally with the other NSAIDs. With a long list of NSAID products available by prescription and a wide variety of OTC NSAID products available, you can see how the wheels are set in motion for duplication of therapy to occur. Patients may not be familiar with the terms non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or NSAID, and they may not realize that the prescription medication they take for their arthritis is the same medication or the same type of medication that they bought over the counter for their back pain. 
or patients may choose a product for sleep or cold and flu and not realize it contains an ANSAID identical to or similar to the one they're taking by prescription. Finally, patients may be instructed by their physicians to take low-dose aspirin or they may even be self-medicating with low-dose aspirin and not realize that there are risks involved with taking other NSAIDs along with this aspirin therapy. If the FDA recommendation for NSAID use is to use the lowest dose possible, then duplication of NSAID therapy certainly does not meet that goal. So we need to be aware of these duplications and when they can occur. Before we look at the FDA warnings about serious side effects associated with NSAIDs, let's just review the common side effects of NSAID use. As you will notice from this list, most of them are gastrointestinal in nature. There's upset stomach, stomach pain, constipation or diarrhea, gas, heartburn, nausea and vomiting, as well as dizziness. The frequency of stomach upset is the reason we counsel patients to take NSAIDs with food because that will help to alleviate some of these common side effects. In addition to the common side effects, there are some more serious adverse effects of NSAIDs. While they are more serious than upset stomach, they do not warrant black box warnings. One of these more serious adverse effects is hepatic disease or failure. Risk factors for developing hepatotoxicity are age greater than 50 years, female gender, underlying autoimmune disease, and concomitant therapy with other hepatotoxic drugs. Although liver damage can occur with any of the NSAIDs, ibuprofen and celecoxib seem to show the least incidence of liver toxicity. Hepatotoxicity from NSAIDs can appear as acute hepatitis or it can mimic the symptoms of chronic hepatitis. So signs and symptoms of NSAID-induced liver disease include fatigue, nausea, lethargy, pruritus, jaundice, upper right quadrant pain or tenderness, and flu-like symptoms. Patients who are taking NSAIDs and experience any of these symptoms should be counseled to stop taking the NSAID and see their physician immediately. In addition, NSAIDs should be used with caution and at lower doses in patients who already have moderate hepatic impairment and should not be used at all in patients with severe impairment. Hepatotoxicity caused by NSAIDs usually resolves within four to eight weeks of discontinuing the drug, but patients who have had a hepatotoxic reaction to NSAIDs should avoid NSAID therapy in the future. They can take acetaminophen for pain, and they can also continue to take aspirin because aspirin is structurally different enough from the other NSAIDs not to cause the same hepatotoxicity. NSAID use can also have hematologic effects such as anemia due to fluid retention, gastrointestinal blood loss, or other undefined effects. The use of NSAIDs can also be associated with the development of serious anemias such as agranulocytosis, thrombocytopenia, and aplastic anemia, but the occurrence of these anemias is rare. Another hematologic effect of NSAIDs is the decreased blood clotting and prolonged bleeding times. This is, in fact, the reason that people take low-dose aspirin every day to reduce clotting and help prevent heart attacks. Although traditional NSAIDs can have an effect on clotting, this effect is less than that seen with aspirin. It lasts for a shorter period of time and the effect on clotting is reversible. And also, because of its COX-2 selectivity, celecoxib does not affect clotting or bleeding times. Because of these hematologic side effects, patients on long-term NSAID therapy should have their hematocrit and hemoglobin, um, commonly referred to as H&H, &H, monitored periodically and if they start to develop signs and symptoms of anemia or blood loss. NSAIDs should be used in caution with patients with known coagulation disorders and those who are on anticoagulants. These patients should be monitored closely throughout therapy. And finally, NSAIDs should be stopped prior to surgery to prevent excess bleeding during the procedure. And a good guideline is four to six half-lives is the amount of time prior to surgery that you should stop the NSAID therapy. NSAID use is also associated with two rare but very serious skin rashes. These skin reactions can occur without warning and in the case of the sulfur-containing NSAID celecoxib without prior allergy to sulfur. In Stevens-Johnson syndrome, patients experience flu-like symptoms before a red or purplish rash appears, spreads, and eventually blisters. This blistered skin then dies and peels off. The rash is largely associated with the skin and mucous membranes of the face, mouth, nose, and eyes, but it can also occur in the genital area as well. 
The most serious and sometimes fatal complications of Stevens-Johnson syndrome are sepsis and cellulitis that leads to sepsis. Toxic epidermal necrolysis, or TEN, is a second rare but potentially fatal skin rash that can be associated with NSAID use. The rash associated with TEN is more widespread than that of Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and it can occur on up to 30% of the skin surface compared with just 10% in Stevens-Johnson. TEN is also more likely to result in multi-system organ failure, which can result in death. Stevens-Johnson syndrome and TEN are medical emergencies, so patients who experience a rash that might be associated with NSAID therapy should seek medical attention immediately. The earlier a patient receives supportive treatment, the less likely the chance of infection and the better the prognosis for recovery. A patient who has had a Stevens-Johnson syndrome or TEN reaction to NSAID therapy is at risk for having the reaction again, and so they should avoid NSAIDs entirely in the future. There is also a genetic component to the occurrence of these reactions, so patients who have an immediate family member with a history of Stevens-Johnson syndrome or TEN should also avoid NSAID therapy. Two other rare but serious side effects of NSAID use are asthma exacerbation and anaphylaxis. NSAIDs should be used in caution in patients who have asthma, especially patients with aspirin-sensitive asthma, because an NSAID use in those patients can precipitate another asthma attack. In rare cases, NSAID use can lead to anaphylaxis. The risk of anaphylaxis is greatest in those patients with asthma and what's called the aspirin triad. The three components of the aspirin triad are nasal polyps, asthma, and an aspirin intolerance that results in a severe asthma attack or anaphylactic reaction. So, of course, uncontrolled asthma and anaphylaxis are both life-threatening emergencies, and emergency help is required if these reactions should occur. Another more serious adverse effect of NSAID therapy is renal toxicity or failure. Long-term NSAID administration is known to be associated with renal papillary necrosis or other renal injury, especially when higher doses are used. This risk is increased in patients with prior impaired renal function or a family history of chronic kidney disease or kidney failure. Other comorbidities that increase risk include heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, hypovolemia, liver dysfunction, and salt depletion. The risk of renal impairment is also increased in patients who are taking diuretics, ACE inhibitors, or angiotensin receptor blockers, as well as patients with advanced age. Depending on the criteria that you use, advanced age in this case can be defined as anywhere from over 60 to over age 75. If renal toxicity does occur, discontinuation of NSAID therapy generally results in a return to baseline renal function. If risk factors are present, a patient's serum creatinine level should be assessed at baseline within the first three months of therapy and at least every year while on NSAID therapy to ensure that no renal damage is occurring. Because of the risk of future renal damage, NSAID use is not recommended in patients with decreased liver function whose creatinine clearance is less than 30 mLs per minute. If your place of practice is in a hospital or healthcare setting, this is information that you likely have access to. But if you practice in a retail or community setting, you often do not have access to patient lab values, so you would have no way of knowing what a patient's creatinine clearance is when they begin therapy. Concerns about the cardiovascular safety of NSAIDs began to surface in the late 1990s and early 2000s after the approval of the COX-2 selective NSAIDs Celecoxib, marketed as Celebrex, and rofecoxib, which was marketed under the name Viox. Large clinical trials had shown that these new agents were effective anti-inflammatory drugs with significantly fewer gastrointestinal side effects, but data was also emerging from these trials that showed an increase in cardiovascular risk from these new agents. Perhaps the most well-known of these studies was the Viox Gastrointestinal Outcomes Research, or VIGOR, trial, this study showed a five-fold increase in cardiovascular events for patients taking rofecoxib compared to naproxen. The adenopatous polyp prevention of Vioxx, or APPROVED trial, was stopped early because of an increased risk of serious cardiovascular events in patients taking 25 milligrams of rofecoxib daily. It was at this point that rofecoxib was voluntarily withdrawn from the U.S. market. 
The adenoma prevention with celecoxib, or APC, trial was also stopped early because of data that suggested patients on celecoxib therapy had a greater risk of cardiovascular events than those on placebo. And finally, the Alzheimer's disease anti-inflammatory prevention trial, or ADAPT, showed an increased cardiovascular risk for patients taking naproxen, but not those taking celecoxib. In light of all of the information about serious NSAID-related toxicity, in 2005, the FDA required all prescription and OTC NSAIDs to include a black box warning about the cardiovascular and gastrointestinal risk associated with NSAID use. The FDA black box warning about cardiovascular risk is shown on this slide. NSAIDs may cause an increased risk of serious cardiovascular thrombotic events, myocardial infarction, and stroke, which can be fatal. This risk may increase with duration of use. Patients with cardiovascular disease or risk factors for cardiovascular disease may be at greatest risk, and NSAIDs are contraindicated for the treatment of perioperative pain in the setting of coronary artery bypass graft, or cabbage surgery, because of an increased risk of MI and stroke. All NSAIDs, not just the COX-2 selective celecoxib, carry this black box warning about serious cardiovascular events. From what we know about celecoxib, Decreasing the dose also decreases the cardiovascular toxicity. In the APC trial, a dose of 200 milligrams twice daily was associated with a significantly fewer occurrences of cardiovascular events. Further evidence for increased safety of lower dose celecoxib comes from meta-analysis of many COX-2 inhibitor studies, which show that there is a possibility that celecoxib doses greater than 200 milligrams may increase the risk for cardiovascular events. Meta-analysis also suggests that full-dose naproxen may not increase cardiovascular risk for patients. There was enough evidence of this absence of risk to warrant consideration recently by the FDA. In February of 2014, the FDA Arthritis Advisory Committee and the Drug Safety and Risk Management Advisory Committee voted 16 to 9 to not remove the cardiovascular warning from naproxen. Uh, while nine members of the panel believe that naproxen poses a lower cardiovascular risk than other NSAIDs, the remaining 16 members did not believe the evidence was sufficient to change the warning. Since patients with cardiovascular disease or risk factors for cardiovascular disease may be at greater risk for complications, let's do a quick review of what some of these risk factors are. The American Heart Association divides cardiovascular risk factors into two categories modifiable risks, and non-modifiable risks. The modifiable risks include a pretty familiar list of smoking, hypertension, increased cholesterol, diabetes, being overweight or obese, physical inactivity, stress, excess alcohol use, and poor diet and nutrition. The non-modifiable risk factors include age greater than 65. It's estimated that 82% of those who die from coronary heart disease are age 65 and older. And as age increases, women are more likely to die within a few weeks of a heart attack than men. Another non-modifiable risk factor is gender, with males being at a higher risk for cardiovascular disease than females. Race and ethnicity are also risk factors. African Americans have a higher risk of hypertension and heart disease than Caucasians. Mexican Americans, American Indians, Native Americans, and some Asian Americans have increased risk of heart disease along with an increased risk of diabetes and obesity. Notice that diabetes and obesity are also risk factors, so we start to find ourselves sort of in a vicious cycle here. And finally, family history is a non-modifiable risk factor. Children of parents who had heart disease are more likely to develop heart disease themselves. The second serious adverse event from NSAID use that warrants a black box warning is the risk of gastrointestinal complications. The FDA black box warning about gastrointestinal risk is shown on this slide. NSAIDs cause an increased risk of serious gastrointestinal events, including bleeding, ulceration, and perforation of the stomach or intestines, which can be fatal. These events can occur at any time during use and without warning symptoms, and elderly patients are at greater risk for serious gastrointestinal events. 
Like the cardiovascular warning, this warning applies to all NSAIDs, including the to COX-2 selective celecoxib, but in general, NSAIDs with greater COX-1 selectivity are associated with a greater incidence of GI toxicity. Just looking back at our list of NSAIDs and their selectivity for COX-1 and COX-2, we can see that as we move down the right-hand column away from Selendac and ibuprofen, we would expect GI toxicity to decrease. And as we move up the left-hand column from nebumatone to ketorolac, we would expect GI toxicity to increase. Risk factors that make patients more susceptible to gastrointestinal complications from NSAID use include history of a previous GI event like an ulcer or a GI bleed, complications from a previous GI bleed, age greater than 60. It's reported that as many as 60% of patients over 60 will develop peptic ulcer or hemorrhage. And remember, this age group also includes those patients who are at increased risk for hepatic and renal toxicity as well. Patients who are on anticoagulants or corticosteroids are at a higher risk for gastrointestinal complications as well as those who might be taking more than one NSAID at a time or who are taking low-dose aspirin. Risk factors also include patients who are taking high doses of NSAIDs and patients with comorbidities, especially cardiovascular disease. And finally, the presence of H. pylori bacteria is also a risk factor for the development of serious GI complications due to an NSAID therapy. According to the American College of Rheumatology, patients with risk factors for GI bleeding should have an H&H &H done at the beginning of therapy and repeated at least once during the first year. I mentioned earlier in the program that we will discuss aspirin when it is appropriate in the context of our discussion, and this is one of those times when it is definitely appropriate to discuss the role of aspirin. Taking low-dose aspirin alone without any other NSAID is known to increase the risk of gastrointestinal events like ulcers and GI bleeding. The risk of GI complications from low-dose aspirin are further increased in elderly patients, in patients with comorbidities, and in patients taking corticosteroids or anticoagulants. I bet it would not be too difficult for you to find a patient in whatever your place of practice is that meets all of these criteria, advanced age, multiple co comorbidities, and also taking a corticosteroid or anticoagulant. So that's going to include a lot of our patients. We also know that taking an NSAID in addition to low-dose aspirin therapy increases risk of GI complications. So for this reason, patients who require both low-dose aspirin and NSAID therapy should be given a gastroprotective agent like misoprostol or a proton pump inhibitor to decrease the risk of a serious GI event. And finally, we know that taking the COX-2 selective NSAID celecoxib with low-dose aspirin therapy decreases the effectiveness of the aspirin therapy. So it's recommended that patients taking both of these take the celecoxib and the low-dose aspirin at least 30 minutes apart to avoid this drug-drug interaction. Given these risks, what are some strategies that we can use to effectively treat pain and inflammation with NSAIDs, but also protect patients from harmful adverse events? The American Heart Association recommends a stepwise approach to pain relief for patients with cardiovascular disease. Patients should first start with an OTC medication such as acetaminophen or aspirin, the prescription medication tramadol, or short-term narcotic pain medications. The next step is to use aspirin-like drugs like the non-acetylated salicylates. Then, if an NSAID is needed, start with one that is mostly selective for COX-1 and not very selective for COX-2. Then step up to NSAIDs with some COX-2 selectivity, and finally use a COX-2 selective NSAID only if necessary. In 2009, the American College of Gastroenterology published their guidelines for prevention of NSAID-related ulcer complications. These guidelines were based on scientifically relevant research and allow practitioners to prescribe NSAIDs based on both the gastrointestinal and cardiovascular risk of the patient. The guidelines define two cardiovascular risk categories and three gastrointestinal risk categories. For cardiovascular risk, a low-risk patient is defined as one who does not require low-dose aspirin therapy, and a high-risk patient is one that does require low-dose aspirin therapy. For GI risk, a high-risk patient is one with a history of complicated ulcer, especially if that history is recent, plus two other risk factors from the moderate list category. 
A moderate risk patient is one who meets one or two of the following requirements. Age greater than 65 years, a patient taking high-dose NSAID therapy, a patient with history of a previous uncomplicated ulcer, or a patient on concomitant therapy with low-dose aspirin, corticosteroids, or anticoagulants. And finally, a low-risk patient is one who does not meet any of the criteria for moderate risk. Using this combination of gastrointestinal and cardiovascular risk factors, the practice guidelines for safe prescribing of NSAIDs are as follows. For patients with low cardiovascular risk and low gastrointestinal risk, monotherapy with a traditional NSAID can be used. If the GI risk is moderate, an NSAID plus misoprostol or a PPI should be used. And if the GI risk is high, COX-2 selective celecoxib plus misoprostol or PPI can be used or a non-NSAID alternative should be considered. For patients with high cardiovascular risk, who require low-dose aspirin therapy, if the GI risk is low or moderate, naproxen should be used for its favorable cardiovascular risk profile, and misoprostol or a PPI should be used to protect against increased GI toxicity that results from the aspirin and NSAID combination. And if both cardiovascular and GI risk is high, NSAID should not be used and a non-NSAID alternative should be considered. In keeping with the ACG's guidelines to reduce ulcer complications from NSAID use, there are a few products available that combine an NSAID with a gastroprotective agent. Arthrotec was first approved and marketed in 1997. It's a combination of the NSAID diclofenac with misoprostol to protect the GI mucosa. It comes in two strengths, diclofenac 50 or 75, in combination with 200 micrograms of misoprostol. The 50 milligram product can be given two to four times a day, while the 75 milligram product is recommended only twice daily. Another product that was approved in 2011 is Duexis, a combination of 800 milligrams of ibuprofen with 26.6 milligrams of famotidine. And I know there were no H2 antagonists included in the American College of Gastroenterology's prescribing guidelines on the previous slide. But double-dose H2 antagonist therapy has been shown to be an effective way to reduce the occurrence of ulcers due to NSAID therapy. So double-dose famotidine would be 40 milligrams twice daily, which is how we arrive at 26.6 milligram dose of famotidine in Duexis. Since this product is given three times a day, then 80 milligrams divided by three doses is 26.6 milligrams. There is also a combination product that includes naproxen and a PPI. Vimovo was improved in 2010, and it's a combination of naproxen 375 or 500 with 20 milligrams of esmeprazole. This product is delayed release and dosed twice daily. Although these products are combined to reduce the gastrointestinal risk from NSAID use, these combination products still contain the black box warning about cardiovascular and gastrointestinal risk as the parent products. Another strategy to reduce the risk from NSAID therapy is to use a topical therapy instead of an oral therapy. Topical products are useful when pain is localized to a specific area, like a joint or a specific muscle. Since there is little systemic absorption, there are less side effects and adverse effects than with oral products. Flector patch, approved in 2007, is indicated for the topical treatment of acute pain due to minor strains, sprains, and contusions. Each patch contains 180 milligrams of diclofenac and should be applied to the most painful area twice daily. As with other patch therapies, patients should avoid applying the patch to non-intact or damaged skin, and the most common adverse event is application site irritation. Voltaren gel, also approved in 2007, is indicated for the treatment of osteoarthritis in joints such as the knee and hand. This 1% diclofenac gel comes with a reusable dosing card that allows patients to dispense a 2-gram or 4-gram strip of gel. For the hands, elbows, and wrists, a 2-gram dose is applied directly to the joint four times daily with a maximum dose of 8 grams per day to any affected joint. For knees, ankles, and feet, a 4-gram dose is applied four times daily with a maximum of 16 grams per day to any affected joint. The total daily application of diclofenac gel from all application sites added together 
should not exceed 32 grams per day. As with other topical NSAIDs, the most common adverse reaction is dermatitis at the application site. Diclofenac is also available as PINSAID 1.5% and 2% solution, indicated for the topical treatment of osteoarthritis of the knee. The original formulation, the 1.5% solution, came in a dropper bottle, and 40 drops were applied to each painful knee, 10 drops at a time, 4 times a day, and rubbed into the front, back, and sides of the knee. The new 2% formulation, approved in 2014, comes in a pump bottle, and two actuations equals 40 milligrams of diclofenac, and this is applied to each painful knee only twice daily. Again, the most common adverse effect is an application site reaction. Another strategy to reduce side effects from NSAID products involves creating very small drug particles or nanoparticles to improve absorption and bioavailability. This allows a lower dose of drug to be used in keeping with the goal of using the lowest NSAID dose possible. Although there are no studies to prove it at this time, it's hoped that with lower doses, fewer side effects and adverse events will occur. There are three NSAIDs using nanotechnology currently available, two diclofenac products marketed as Zorvalex and Zipsor, and an endomethacin product marketed as Tiverbex. All of these products are approved to treat mild to moderate acute pain in adults, and as you can see from the slide, they are all available in lower doses than the traditional NSAID products. The diclofenac dose is 18 milligrams or 35 milligrams given twice daily for Zorvalex or 25 milligrams four times daily for Zipsor as compared to a traditional 50 milligram diclofenac product given three times a day. The endomethacin product is 20 milligrams or 40 milligrams given two to three times daily as compared to 25 to 50 milligrams of the traditional endomethacin product. There are two classes of emerging NSAID products that I want to mention quickly before we move on, and they are both considered multi-target drugs because they combine anti-inflammatory activity with gastroprotective and cardioprotective properties. The first drug is a cyclooxygenase inhibiting nitric oxide donator, or abbreviated CYNOD, C-I-N-O-D. This drug molecule combines a cyclooxygenase inhibitor and a nitric oxide releasing functional group. Nitric oxide is a known vasodilator and also has gastroprotective properties. The molecule on this slide is naproxenod, which combines naproxen, highlighted by a circle, with nitric acid, with a nitric oxide donor, highlighted by the square. The makers of naproxenod filed an NDA in 2009, but the FDA declined to approve the drug, citing a lack of long-term safety and efficacy studies. So we may see this drug come up again, but it was not approved the first time. Another class of multi-target NSAIDs under investigation is the hydrogen sulfide releasing NSAIDs. Hydrogen sulfide, like nitric oxide, is known to have gastroprotective and cardioprotective properties. So the drugs shown on this slide are derivatives of diclofenac and naproxen, and early animal studies show that hydrogen sulfide releasing NSAIDs have lower gastrointestinal and cardiovascular toxicity than traditional NSAIDs, um, but all of these studies are still in the preclinical stages. We'll finish the program talking about the role of the pharmacist in following the FDA guidelines for safe use of NSAIDs. The first thing we can do as pharmacists is to counsel patients about the use of prescription NSAIDs. From their prescription history, we may know something about their gastrointestinal and cardiovascular risks, but if we don't know anything about those risks, we can ask them and make sure that they're on an appropriate therapy. In a community pharmacy setting, when we find a patient's NSAID therapy may not be appropriate for their risks, we can share information with them to discuss with their doctor. In a hospital or health system setting, we may have more ability to make changes by using hospital protocols or addressing risk management directly with the prescribing physician. When talking with patients in the community setting, we should always keep the most serious side effects of NSAIDs in mind, such as liver injury or failure, hematologic effects, skin reactions, asthma exacerbation, anaphylaxis, and renal toxicity. That way, when patients come to us and say, I'm having this problem, or I'm not feeling well because of X, Y, or Z, we can assess whether or not any of their symptoms could be related to a serious side effect of their NSAID therapy. 
And in a health system setting, we can work toward greater risk management through the development of protocols and monitoring programs for patients who are on NSAIDs. In an outpatient setting, we can also counsel patients about the use of OTC NSAID products. Remember, all NSAIDs, even ibuprofen and naproxen, carry the same black box warnings about cardiovascular and gastrointestinal risk. So we can make patients aware of these warnings when they purchase OTC products from us, remind them that higher doses of NSAIDs may represent higher risk, so more is not always better, and that NSAID therapy should be used for the shortest period of time needed to relieve their pain. Because many people take low-dose aspirin, we should also remind patients that taking an NSAID along with low-dose aspirin can increase their risk of gastrointestinal side effects. We can counsel patients in inpatient and outpatient settings about the duplication of NSAID therapy, remembering that patients may not always be aware that NSAIDs are available by prescription and over-the-counter. When patients are purchasing OTC NSAIDs, we can ask, do you take any medications for arthritis? to see if they're taking a prescription NSAID or even an OTC NSAID for arthritis. Patients may not realize that a medication for arthritis and a medication for back pain could have the same medication or the same type of medication in them. When counseling patients about prescription NSAIDs, we can ask, do you take any other medications for pain? Again, they may be taking an NSAID over-the-counter for pain and not realize it's the same type of medication they're taking for their arthritis. During cold and flu season or even during allergy season, we could ask patients, are you taking any cold medications? Because many OTC cold, flu, and allergy medications also contain NSAIDs. And again, we should always remember to ask patients about low-dose aspirin therapy when talking with them about NSAIDs over-the-counter or prescription. Since low-dose therapy can be purchased over-the-counter, a pharmacist may not always have access to that information through prescription records, and we may not know if they're taking a low-dose aspirin therapy or not.